Guys, it is uh, good to see you. Go ahead um, and grab a seat. And guys, we're going to get right to work today. So I want to invite you to grab your Bible and find your way to Ruth chapter 2, okay? Um, and as you get there, if you're new to Doxa, I want to welcome you again. My name is Rob. I'm one of the pastors here. It's, it's great to have you part of our church family today. You're actually joining us in the midst of a study through the, the small but great Old Testament book of Ruth, which is honestly like the greatest little love story ever written. But the thing that we've, we've discovered as we've been going through the book of Ruth is it's not just like an ancient rom-com, right? It's not just like a book that's named after a woman so that only the women in here do that in their women's Bible studies. But what we're seeing is that it's actually the Word of God. And there's a lot for every single one of us to learn that this little love story in Ruth is actually part of God's big love story that involves every single one of us here today. But we find ourselves in chapter two today. So as we get into this, all right, I wanna catch us all up to speed um, with this story, okay? So in chapter one that we've been going through the last several weeks, the the stage is kind of set for the whole story of Ruth with a bunch of F words, all right? So I know I woke up some of you guys, congratulate, welcome, okay? Um, But we we saw this, that it started off with a free-for-all, right, when it led to a famine, there was some failures, there was some funerals, and then chapter one ended with a little bit of faith. And so as we get into Ruth, you know, Ruth takes place in the time of the judges, which is a very dark time in the history of the world, all right, a 400-year period right around like 1500 BC to 1100 BC um, where there was no king. So Judges ends in chapter 21, verse 25, that says there's no king, and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. All right, and so this was just a free-for-all. Everybody was just living and doing whatever they wanted. And so it was just a spiritually, morally, culturally dark time in the history of the world. But in the midst of this free-for-all, where no one's looking to God, no one's honoring God in his word, a famine hits the land. And as this famine hits, it hits the nation of Israel, this town of Bethlehem. And as we talked about, this was like a very strange thing to happen because Bethlehem is very significant in the story and the plan of God. And Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. All right, and so Bethlehem was the promised land that God gave to his people as a gift. It was a wonderful land. It was a fertile land. It was a land that would provide richly for his people. But this family hits a place where God usually provides greatly. And what we learned is that it was actually not happenstance, but it was that God was withholding his provision as an act of judgment for the rebellion and the sin of his people. And so as God brought about this famine, it wasn't, and please hear me on this, it wasn't just to crush people and to demoralize people and to hold people down and to hurt them, but God brought about this famine to ultimately bring about repentance in his people with the hope that they would repent from their sin and just turn back to him. But here in Bethlehem, all right, there's this family, right? And we've met them over the last couple weeks. It's, this family is led by a guy named Elimelech. He's got a wife named Naomi. He's got two sons, Malon and Kilion. And what we found is, as we looked at Elimelech and his boys, is that they all failed in some pretty profound ways. Because what Elimelech decided to do was he decided to move his family out of Bethlehem, away from this famine, all the way to a place called Moab. Moab was probably about 30 to 50 miles away from Bethlehem. And this move, as we've talked about over the last couple weeks, was just a massive failure. Because Moab was a nation that rejected God. Absolute godless nation, a very wicked nation, a very sinful nation. They worshiped the false demon god, Chemosh. There was a lot of sexual perversion that was happening among the people that lived in this nation. Furthermore, what they would actually do is they would take their young kids and actually sacrifice them to appease this false demon god named Chemosh. So a very dark place. And this is why God, throughout his word in the Old Testament, told his people, don't even go to Moab. Don't marry Moabite people. And if you look at places like Psalm 60, God actually calls and refers to Moab as his wash wash basin for his feet. And so what we're talking about is a really anti-God place. But in the midst of this, you know, Elimelech was just worried about his family. He really doesn't trust God in his words of promise, and so he moves his family to a place where they never should have went. Away from God's people, away from God's presence, 
And they go there, and chapter 1 says that they were going to start there and just sojourn. They were just going to go there for a little while until things got a little bit better, and then they were going to leave. But what we found out is that they ended up being there for 10 years. And in the midst of these 10 years, the two boys, Malon and Kilion, they marry Moabite, anti-God, like Chemosh-worshipping women, which was a decision that they made that was in opposition to who God is and what God says in places like Deuteronomy chapter 23. And as this happens, in this 10-year period of time, this woman, Naomi, she ultimately experiences three different funerals. First, she buries her husband, and then she buries both of her boys. But these, this family, they, they went to Moab to escape the thing that they feared most, but that they found it when they got there, and it was death. And so there's this free-for-all there's this famine, these, these men failed, there's these three different funerals, and what we're left with is three broken, widowed, homeless women. You have Naomi, and then her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and the big question in chapter one is like, what are they going to do now? Like, what are these women going to do? Because I need you to understand, in this time, there were no governmental programs for these types of women. Society wasn't set up to like help these widowed women. So if you were a widowed woman or a single woman in this time, there was really no help for you and ultimately no hope for you. And so what Naomi decides to do is she decides to go back to God's presence. She decides to go back to God's people. She ultimately decides to go back to Bethlehem. And so Orpah she goes back to her family. She goes to her back to her false god Chemosh. She goes back to her people and her ways. But Ruth the other daughter-in-law, she says this in chapter one. She looks at Naomi and says, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Remember this? Ruth makes this declaration of loyalty, and she turns away from the God of Moab, and she turns towards the God of Bethlehem. And in this moment, in chapter one, this is Ruth declaring her love and loyalty to the Lord. And this is her moment of salvation and she literally becomes a new person where she's not defined by her background and her sin anymore, but she's defined by God as a child of God. And she's made new, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is her salvation moment. But Ruth and Naomi, they then go and make this journey back to Bethlehem. They're homeless, they're broken, they're bankrupt, they're just suffering and they're hurting. And guys, as I say that, I know that that, this is the, the story of some of you that sit in here. Like in a room this size, I know that some of you, you're hurting today. Some of you are in a really painful place today. And if that's you, guys, here's here's what I want to tell you. I want you to hear this. While Ruth chapter 1 begins with heartbreak, the good news today is that we're turning the page. That we're starting in chapter 2. That chapter one comes to an end and we're in chapter two. And I don't know who this is for, but metaphorically speaking, for some of you, I believe that God, through his word, by his spirit, is gonna turn the page of your story today. Like this is the word, this is the nature of this book. This is the word of God. It's the power of God to save. And this is a, is a, sets people free. It gives people hope. And I know that as we open up the word of God today, that some of you are going to find that freedom, that God is going to break in and he's going to speak some truth over your life. He's going to give some hope in your life to push you forward into another day. And this has been my prayer all week as we get into this beautiful chapter of Ruth chapter two. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through this, okay? I'm just going to walk through this entire chapter. I'm going to kind of make some comments along the way explaining what's going on in this. And then we're going to lean into something that is revealed to us here in this chapter that I really believe that God wants to, to use in our church family. But here's what we see, all right? Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. All right, and and this is significant. We're going to stop here because later on in the story, Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz is one of their redeemers, meaning that Boaz, he may have some legal obligation and responsibility to help these women due to being Elimelech's relative. But what's so important, guys, is not only is Boaz a, a relative, but if you look back, it says that he's a worthy man. And when you look at this in the Hebrew, this can be translated in a number of different ways and understood in a number of different ways, but it's pointing to the idea that Boaz is like a a strong, a capable, a wealthy man. The name Boaz literally means strength. 
All right, but in addition to this, he's not just a man of standing and means, but he's also a man of integrity and godliness, which we're gonna see here in just a few minutes. And so in short, guys, Boaz was both a man of moral worth and material possessions. Now look at verse two. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went, to, went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come. If you have your Bible in front of you, I want you to underline this in your Bible. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. All right, so Ruth and Naomi are in Bethlehem now. Ruth decides, hey, I got, I'm going to go out, I'm going to glean in the fields. Now, I just want to explain to you what gleaning means, okay? Um, gleaning was really just a provision that God had in the Old Testament in places like Leviticus 19 uh, for the poor. That I don't know if you know this about God, but God has a heart for the poor. God loves the poor. And as God's people, we love the things that God loves, Amen. And so as the church of God, as the people of God, this is one of the things that should mark our lives as Christians, is not just being concerned about ourselves, but being concerned for the marginalized and the the downtrodden and the poor. But what God had in place in this, in this time, rather than just giving those who are poor money or provision, they had to work. All right, and part of this was so that they would have their own dignity. All right, but in this time, if you were somebody who had a field like Boaz did, all right, you would go out into the field with your workers and your workers would harvest and then that would provide your income. This is how you would make money. And what God wanted them to do was to leave the margins around the field untouched for the marginalized. All right, that the margins of the field were for the, margin, uh, for the marginalized. This was God's plan. And so the way it would work is that if you were poor or if you were hungry and just in need, you could find one of God's people And their business, because they are one of God's people, their business had a percentage of their profits set aside so that you could literally eat into their profits. The margins were left for the marginalized. And I'll even say that some of you in here, I know there's a lot of entrepreneur type people in our church family. If you are a man or a woman that owns a business, this is part of the way that you should be thinking about it. Or you're going to learn a lot from Boaz and the way that he handles his business, the way he treats his employees, the way that he uses his wealth to help people. This needs to be part of the way that Christian business owners use what God has given them to help the marginalized. And so Ruth, she's thinking, okay, God has a heart for people like me. And God's people, they make provisions for people like me. So if I could just go out and if I could just find one of God's people, then I'm gonna find God's provision. And so she goes out to look for food for her and Naomi. And if you look back to verse three, it says that she happened to come to the field of Boaz. Now guys, I need to tell you guys, as we read this, we're meant to see kind of like God winking at us, okay? All right, then when it says it just so happened, in the original Hebrew, it's in this text, it kind of means that chance chanced. All right, so it's just by a stroke of luck, she showed up. She just happened to show up. By luck of the draw, she shows up to glean in this field, and it just happened to be that it belonged to this guy named Boaz, this wealthy, this godly man. And in the Hebrew, guys, this was a way to make it clear that this was providence and not chance. It was God doing this. It wasn't that she just happened to show up. And this brings up one of the great themes of the entire book of Ruth, this idea that it just so happened. See, I, I don't know if you've been doing this or not, but we challenged you uh, as we started going through this is that it takes about 23 minutes at a leisurely pace to read through the entire book of Ruth. And so we challenged you every week, read through the book of Ruth and just see how God might move in your life. But if you've been reading through Ruth, all right, you've noticed that there's no supernatural miracles of God, right? Have you seen that? No burning bush, no parting of the Red Sea, no dead guys coming back to life. You don't see the supernatural miracles of God. But what you do see is the supernatural providence of God all the way through this book. And we touched on this week one. But here's what providence means. It's just a it's a big theological word that basically says this. Providence is really just it's whenever God uses natural circumstances to bring about his supernatural plans. And so, so it's when, like, very practically in your life today, it's when you think, like, you just happen to go to this one place. 
And when you happen to go to that one place, you just happen to meet that one person. And it just happened to lead to something else, and then all of that just happened to lead to God's blessing in your life. Right, you've been there, right? We've all kind of been there where you're like, I don't know why I showed up here. It, like, it just happened to be like this. Guys, this is the providential power of God. That providence is God working in all things to bring about his goodwill. And so Ruth didn't show up to Boaz's field by chance, but it was God's invisible hand leading her for her ultimate good. He's that good. That he was with her every step of the way. Every step of the way. That's why we titled this sermon series, Every Step of the Way, because I, I need you, I hope you, we, we need to see God in this way, that he is with us every step of the way. And what I want you to see in addition to this, guys, is that Ruth showing up in the field of Boaz, and this is awesome, is the answer to a prayer that Naomi prayed in chapter one. So if you look back to chapter one, verses eight and nine, All right, Naomi prayed this prayer. She said, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest. So in chapter one, Naomi prayed that God would take care of Ruth. And then here in chapter two, we see that her prayer is actually beginning to be answered. And so, Doc, so this is what I'll tell you. Pray. Pray. I say this all the time, that prayer is where the action is. And I know sometimes we think like, okay, like prayer doesn't really, I don't know how it works, I don't think it actually does. Guys, I need you to understand the great blessing of prayer. That when you pray, if you are a child of God, your prayers don't stop at the ceiling, but they go directly to the ears of God. And God hears and he answers prayer. And so in chapter one, there's a prayer. And then chapter two is the beginning of the answering of that prayer by God. And as we see this, guys, we're reminded that prayer is effective, that prayer works, it encourages us to be a praying people especially when we're in the midst of dire circumstances, just like these two women. I really believe this to be true. Guys, I'm not just trying to, it's not hyperbolic of me to be extra spiritual as a pastor. I mean, this is what we rooted and founded our church on. I know a lot of you have asked me like about the logo of our church and all this stuff, and I need you to understand it's not because we love geometry, okay? The hexagon in our logo with the X in the middle actually means something, and it was a prayer since the beginning before anybody showed up of what our church would be all about that the six parts of the hexagon actually represent the six parts to the Lord's Prayer. And then the X in the middle is the first letter of the Greek word Christos, meaning Christ. And so what we want to be and what we've been asking God to cause us to be is a church that is centered on Jesus that is all about prayer. And this is where the action is. And we're seeing this here in chapter 2. Let's keep going. Verse 4. And behold... Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She says, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep by my, my young women. Let your eyes be on this field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. All right, so Ruth lands in the field of Boaz. He takes notice of her, and him being just a, a godly, just man, He allows her to glean from his field and then goes out of his way to protect her and to provide for her and her needs. And I know that some of us, we might think that, hey, he's just a good dude. That's like my neighbor. He's a good dude, right? I need you to understand that this is in the context of the time of the judges where everyone was doing right in their own eyes. That Boaz is standing out as kind of like a shining star amongst a black sky. And he is just wildly good almost like incredibly good that you're just like, this is what he's doing. He, many people were not doing this. They would hear God's law and they would say, well, we're not gonna do that, especially after a famine. But Boaz, he goes out of his way to do this and he is like this bright light in the midst of a dark room. And Christian, if I could just say this to you, this is us. This is who Jesus saved us to be. 
And I don't know about you, but when I look around the world, I see a lot of times of the judges that we're living in the midst of, where everybody is doing right in their own eyes. It's dark, it's broken, it's wicked. It's very much anti-God. And there are pressures from culture and other spiritual influences that will cause you to want to kind of twist and bend and conform. And soon enough, the light of your life just kind of gets snuffed out. We need to be like Boaz. We need to stand, stand firm. Stand firm on the word of God, the true north of Jesus, and love like Jesus, and live like Jesus, and give like Jesus, and serve like Jesus. This is what we are created to be. This is who Jesus died and rose to establish us to be. People like Boaz. But look at verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing down to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes? That you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law and since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to the people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel. And I want you to underline this next part in your Bible. Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Ruth can't believe the grace that's being shown to her as an outsider. That she falls on her face that Boaz is the very type of person that she was hoping to meet. This is back in verse two, if you look. She was trying to find someone to show her favor, and now she meets it, and so she's overwhelmed, and so she's probably thinking, I'm having faith, but man, I don't know if this is gonna happen, but she experiences it, and now her faith is being rewarded. And she asks Boaz, like, why have I found favor in your eyes? And if you look back, Boaz just says, I know who you are. I've heard your story. And he says, the way that you've turned to God the way that you've honored God with your life, the way that you've sacrificed and served and cared for Naomi is being rewarded in this moment, not just by me, but ultimately by God because of your faithfulness. And then verse 13, then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsels in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he, he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some leftover. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her, and also pull out some of the bundles for her to leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, then she beat out what she had gleaned. It was about an ephah of barley, okay? So this is a good amount of food that she gleaned, about 35 liters of dried barley. And then verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over from being satisfied. So Ruth just joins Boaz in this meal and he just continues to bless her far beyond what the law would require him. And many people at this point that like to think of Ruth as kind of like a modern day example for how to date and relate and all this stuff, they would say, wow, this is a big moment. This is the first date right? There's so much romance. I don't think that's actually what's happening right here, okay? Like, the romance is going to come, but I think it's going to come in, like, chapter three. But what's happening here is this is just lunch break, all right? They're out in the field. They're sweaty. They're dirty. And once again, Boaz, he's looking at this girl, and he's like, you're so poor. You probably didn't pack a lunch. Come eat with me. And he gives her food, and he's just taking care of her. And she takes the leftovers home to Naomi, and then verse 19, and her mother-in-law saw, or and her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, this, this man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And then Ruth the Moabite says, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth goes home to Naomi, gives her the food from the gleaning and the leftovers from the meal, and Naomi's just shocked. And Ruth tells her, hey, I met this guy named Boaz. He's the one that took such good care of me. And as Naomi's hearing this, she starts to connect the dots. All right, and she's telling, she tells Ruth, hey, this is a relative of my dead husband 
but he's also one of our redeemers. And in the Hebrew, it literally means a kinsman redeemer. And we're going to get more into this concept in the next few weeks. But a redeemer was just a close relative who was able to come to the aid of a family member. And so in one sense, Boaz has already acted as a redeemer by providing for Ruth and Naomi. But Naomi, guys, she has more in mind. Because she knows what God's law says in places like Leviticus 25 about a kinsman redeemer. And so what Naomi is going to do, bitter Naomi is she's going to start turning into like, she's the original Match.com lady, okay? She's going to start doing this. But with this, all right, the chapter kind of just closes, and Naomi just says, hey, all this is good. You should just stick by Boaz. And what we're seeing is the turning of the page of the story of Ruth and Naomi. They're moving past chapter one of hardship And they're seeing, they're starting to see God turn the page of blessing coming. And that's how it ends, chapter two. Now, here's what's been going on in my head throughout the week as I've been studying this passage and just spending time in this chapter. Romans 15, four came to mind. All right, it's gonna come up here on the screen, but the apostle says, Paul says this in Romans 15, four. He says, for whatever was written in the former days, All right, so what Paul is doing is he's thinking about the Old Testament. He's thinking about like the books like Ruth. And he was just like, those books like Ruth, whatever was written like Ruth was written for what? For our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures that we may have hope. So Doxa, here's what this means. All right, the book of Ruth with the story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz isn't just to entertain us. All right, and it's not even to just inform us of historical events that actually happened, but I want you to understand this. God gave us the book of Ruth and the story of these people to give us a vision for our life and ultimately point us to the, towards the hope that we all need. And as I was thinking about this, the word character just kept popping into my head. And, and I know you can look through chapter two and you're like, that word's not in there, bro. I know, but it was just kept popping in my head. And I started thinking about this, but throughout the chapter of, of, of Ruth here, we see the character of the three main characters of this chapter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at Ruth, Boaz, and God. All right, we're going to start with Ruth. But what do we learn about Ruth that Romans 15 says should give us a vision for our life and and should instruct us and give us hope? Here's what we see about Ruth. All right, Ruth was a great woman with great godly character. And this makes her just a model for young women. And so for those of you women that are, you're, you're single and you're here and you're young, like you had to, you've had to sit through a lot of marriage ser- sermons, okay, so this is your opportunity to be like, great, this one's for me, a single woman named Ruth, you're going to learn from her today, all right? And here's how I want you to think about her. And, and guys, this is not an opportunity for you to tune out. There's a lot of things that are probably going to challenge you about your walk with God as you look at this fabulous woman named Ruth. All right, but ladies, as you look at Ruth, I don't want you to think about a perfect woman, but I want you to think of an exemplary woman. But a few things about Ruth. First, guys, she is a woman of faith. I love this woman. And her faith, as we see, if you look back at her story, it's not a passive faith. All right, that Ruth is not just sitting back and saying, like, Lord, I need some stuff. Would you please just bless me as I sit here and eat Cheetos? Right? She's, it's not passive. But she has an active faith. Guys, true faith is active. And this is what I love about her little statement in verse two. If you look back to verse two, she says, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna find what? Favor. This is the word for grace. This is pointing to the goodness of God. And so here, Ruth is really just saying, God's not gonna fail me. He's not gonna forsake me. He's not done with me. But I actually know that God will favor me and I need to go out and I need to find his favor. And I just want you to see this, guys. Ruth is out there searching for God's provision in her life. That she trusts that God is sovereign. She trusts that God is good. She trusts that God has a future and a plan and a hope and an opportunity for her. And while she has no idea what it looks like, she's gonna go out and find it. That at this point in her life, her life is just so hard, right? And in so many ways, but here's what she says. She's looking at her life and she says, you know what? There's really nothing good in my life right now but I know that there will be, and I'm gonna go out and find it. Doc said, that's faith. That is absolutely faith. That faith doesn't just say everything's great when it's not. 
I know that some of you have grown up in churches where if you're suffering or you're depressed or you're sad or you're going through it and you kind of start talking about it, people look at you and be like, you know why you're going through this is because you don't have faith. Guys, faith, it's not just saying everything's great and putting on a smile when it's not. Faith is not just saying, well, when God shuts a door, he opens a window and my setback is really just my comeback. Like, it's not that, okay? Like, that's a little prosperity gospel, right? Sounds great, not biblical, okay? But here's what Ruth says. She says, things are hard, but God is good. And he's not forsaken me. He's not gonna fail me. He's gonna favor me, and I'm gonna find him. Guys, that's faith. She's not denying the hardships of her circumstances, but she's trusting in the character of God. And she's saying, I'm gonna go out there and find favor. There's hope for me. There's a plan for me. There's provision for me. I'm gonna go out there and find it. And her faith ultimately produces hope, which changes Naomi. All right, look back to verses 19 and 20. Right? Like, I love this, right? Faith led Ruth to go to Boaz's field. She finds provision. She finds protection. She's filled with hope. She goes home. She tells Naomi what had happened. And in response to hearing what had happened, Naomi not only blesses Boaz, but she blesses the Lord. And guys, this is significant because you remember Naomi at this point? Just a broken, bitter old woman. That she hears the story. I mean, you remember this? She shows up and she changes her name to Mara, which means just bitter. But she hears of Boaz's favor and she connects it to God's favor and her life begins to change. That this is like the beginning of like a personal revival in Naomi's life because she's finally got hope because she finally remembered and sees the character of our good God. Now secondarily, I need you to understand that Ruth is industrious, all right, meaning that she's like a really hard worker. All right, if you look back to verse seven, she works from early morning without even resting. Then in verse 17, we see that she gleaned until evening. And so we learn that Ruth, you know, her faith didn't mean that she was just lazy. And she wasn't just waiting around to see how God was going to provide. A lot of Christians today, we just do that. We say, I have faith, and then we just sit there and we don't do anything. This is not the example of Ruth. That Ruth tries to make the very best of her situation that she can. She's trusting God that he's good and that he's going to provide, but she does what she can and she actually works hard. That Ruth just exemplifies the diligence of the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. Third thing, she's not just filled with faith. She's not just a hard worker, but guys, Ruth is humble. She's humble, and I I really want you to see this. That she doesn't go into the fields with a sense of entitlement. She doesn't. But she limps into the field with humility. She kind of goes there, finds the landowner, hoping that he will be gracious to her and show her favor. And when she meets Boaz, this is a picture of just humility and grace meeting. And if you're familiar with your Bible, guys, the biblical writers emphasize the centrality of humility in the life of a Christian. And so Ruth really just illustrates the truth of Proverbs 3.34 and James 4.6, where it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then Proverbs 3, it talks about he is scornful to those who are scorned, and, and he is gracious, and he gives favor to those who are humble. Because I need you to understand, when it comes to pride, God hates it. That God is in heaven. If you look at James 4 and then 1 Peter 5, like, or 1 Peter 3, he is up in heaven doing two things. He's opposing proud people, and he's giving grace to humble people. And if you just think about that, that is terrifying. I wonder how much different our lives would be and how much we might experience to a heightened degree the movement of God in our lives if we were humble like Ruth. I think we would do well to follow her example. And then finally, Ruth is a good friend, a gospel friend, as we talk about in Foundations, as Chris talked about a couple weeks ago, but she's only got really one friend, right? Naomi, her bitter old mother-in-law. Right, ladies, that sounds great, doesn't it? (laughs) And it's fair to say Naomi's not in a great spot, right? She's just bitter. She's not fun to be around. She's the lady that shows up to dox the women. You're putting on your name tag, and she just writes bitter with a frowny face, right? And you're just like, you all all right, girl? No, (laughs) right? 
But I love this about Ruth. She is not a friend of convenience. She's a friend of commitment. She's a gospel friend. She doesn't just seek after friendships to get something that she wants, but she takes the posture of God to give what they need. And she sticks by. She's like a picture of the friend in Proverbs, the friend that sticks closer to a brother. And so Ruth just exemplifies a life worth imitating. And this is what Paul is getting at in Romans 15. And so maybe in connection group this week, you talk about Ruth and you talk about your life. Hold up your life to hers and just pray for each other. Repent and ask God to help you live like Ruth. I think that's a prayer that God would love to answer. And so that's Ruth. But what can we learn from Boaz? We talked about Boaz a little bit, right? That he's a man of standing. And I'll, and I'll say this, guys. I think one of the biggest problems in our world today is there aren't a lot of men of standing. There's a lot of men of sitting, where men are just passive. And what we see of Boaz is he's a strong man. He's a tough man. But he's actually not just tough, okay? And men, I'll talk to you because I know that some of us, we have this misunderstanding of what masculinity and being a man actually is about, and we think it's about being strong and tough. I need you to know that that's not it. That it's not just about being strong and tough, but when we look at Boaz, we see that he was also soft and tender. That this man had a work ethic, he had some drive, he had some discipline, he had some love, and we need more men like Boaz. But when we look at Boaz, we see what a man of faith looks like in the everyday stuff of life because he knows who God is. He knows what God is like and then he patterns his life after God and this shows by the way that his life was just marked by mercy and justice as he noticed Ruth being vulnerable and then went beyond what he needed to do to take care of this woman. And and I wanna linger on this for just a minute, this idea of mercy and justice. And I want you to look at Micah 6, 8 and how God summarized this, this idea as a way of life. In Micah 6, 8, it says this. God says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Men of Doxa, can we throw away all the stuff that we see on the internet? Can we throw away all the messages that we get from culture and social media about what being a real man is? And can we just lock our eyes on the word of God here? and say, this is our template. Boaz gives us an example to follow. But first, Boaz does justice by following God's word regarding the widow and the stranger and the poor by allowing Ruth to glean from his field. See, guys, I told you this. Like, the landowners of this time were not friendly towards these types of people. They were doing whatever they wanted. They were just coming off a famine. But God, Boaz loved God, and he listened to God, and he lived it out. All right, hear me, men, please, just hear this. Boaz didn't have lip service, he had lifestyle. And so many of us as Christians, we're really good at the lip service stuff, but it's all about lifestyle. It's living like Jesus and loving like Jesus. He lived this out by obeying God to do justice. In addition, though, he not only provided food for Ruth, but he protected her. Because in this time, if you were single or if you were widowed, you could be easily mistreated and abused, just as many women are today. But Boaz, he offers protection, defending the poor and the needy, that he used his influence for those who had no influence. That he used what he had, not to just make his life a little bit more comfortable, but to help make other people's lives better that could not do it on their own. This is a real man. Third thing you see is Boaz used his words to bless Ruth. He's showing her personal dignity and respect, and he honors, if you look back, he honors Ruth in verse 11, and he prays for her in verse 12. He speaks kindly to her in verse 13, and then he even invites her to have a meal with him at his table in verse 14. This is more than justice. This is what Micah 6, 8 talks about with loving kindness. He's a real man. And you'll notice that he also walks humbly with God. And this is shown in so many ways. It's seen in his consideration of Ruth, the way that he treats his workers. Some of you guys that have employees, take a lesson from him. He greets them. And some of you Christian business owners, I need you to understand that you might be the only pastor that your employees ever have. He's, he's, He's godly. 
His acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and the fact that he shares a meal with the people who culturally are below him. He lives with humility. Men, do you live with that type of humility? This is who God has created you to be. This is who your family needs you to be, men. This is who our church needs you to be. This is who our world needs you to be. These types of men like Boaz. We need more men like Boaz, not passive and not abusive, but tough and tender like Jesus. Amen? Amen. The ladies are like, amen. Guys, let's go. Guys, you can do this. We can do this. It's not because we've unlocked something here and that we got some really strong men, but it's because we have the Spirit of God. Amen? And the Spirit of God empowers us to live like Jesus. We have this, men. Now, let me end with this. Ruth 2 is not just about us seeing the character of Ruth and the character of Boaz, but Ruth 2, along with the rest of the Bible, is ultimately all about God. All right, this book is, is not ultimately about you. It's ultimately about God. It includes you, but this is a book about God. And in this chapter, we see something so beautiful and so powerful and so comforting about our great God, and it's this is that God is providentially good. I need you to understand this. He's providentially good. Look back to verse three and verse 12. Verse three says, she she happened to come to the field of Boaz. And then verse 12, Boaz is speaking. He says, the Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wing you have come to take refuge. Here's what I want you to understand about our God. He's providentially good. See, if you're not familiar with this, the way that God works in the Bible is that he has two proverbial hands. One is the hand of miracle. And this is the visible hand of God. All right, so this is when an angel shows up. This is when a voice comes from a burning bush. This is when a dead guy comes back to life. It's the supernatural, miraculous, inexplicable, fully obvious hand of God, the visible, miraculous hand of God. But I need you to understand that God also works through his invisible hand of providence. And this is where an angel doesn't speak. This is where a miracle doesn't happen. But God provides through circumstances because we don't believe necessarily in just circumstances. Amen? We don't believe necessarily in just happenstance or chance. We believe in God's providence. And we believe that sometimes God puts us in a place And that's the place that we're supposed to be. And that God introduces us to a person and that's how we're supposed to meet. And that God has a way of organizing and directing our life events. And oftentimes we don't see this, what he's doing when we're looking out the front end or the front window of the car when we're driving towards the future. But we oftentimes see this in the rear view mirror as we look past in the past. Amen? You've seen it? You're like, I don't know why I showed up there. I don't think that was an accident. I don't think it was an accident that I met that person. I don't think it was an accident that I actually got that job. I don't think it was an accident that I moved to that place. It's the providential hand of God that God is involved every step of the way. Every step of the way. And here's where it gets very practical. Some of you, I know that you would wonder in your time of need, in your time of struggle or crisis or longing or hurt, you're wondering, God, where are you? Where are you? What are you doing? Like, have you given up on me? I know some of you are sitting there and you've asked those questions because you're just walking through it. In those times, you need to remind yourself of the truth that he's got a second hand and he could be working in less obvious ways, but he's still working. He's still working. For those of you who are just wearied saints, wondering what God is doing, he's working. And he's always good. And this is what we see in verse 12 when Boaz says, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. That Boaz uses this traditional metaphor of God's protective wings. And this concept, we get it, right? Because it's like you're taking someone under your wing to help them, to guide them, to protect them, right? But in Scripture, Under his wings is a metaphor for the protective refuge of God's presence. And the image is kind of like a mother bird taking her vulnerable hatchlings under her wing to nurture them. 
to train them, to shelter them, to guide them, and to protect them. In Jesus, he speaks about this in Matthew 23, in Luke 13. If you read Psalm 91, it speaks of this beautiful thing about being under the wings of God. It's a place of faith which is connected to a promise. That with God there is security and there is guidance and there's provision and there's protection. It's a promise for the goodness of God for God's people. Under his wing. This is why Romans 8.28, the Apostle Paul says that God works all things, to bring all things to good for those who love him. This is our God. This is what we need to hold on to. We have to hold on to this when we experience hardships and life just kicks us in the face. God is providentially good and we can trust that. We need to. See guys, the story of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is like our Boaz and that we are all kind of like Ruth. That we come from the wrong family just like Ruth that she came from the family of Lot and incest, we come from the family line of Adam and sin. Ruth grew up very spiritually confused, and we all start off very spiritually confused. Ruth ultimately comes to Boaz with her hands empty, and she needs his grace to provide, and we come to the Lord Jesus, spiritually speaking, with our hands empty, asking for his grace to provide. That Boaz spoke to Ruth as Jesus speaks to us, Boaz protected Ruth and Jesus protects us. Boaz provided for Ruth as Jesus provides for us. Boaz put Ruth in community with God's people and Jesus puts us in community as God's people. It's all about Jesus. It all goes back to Jesus. You're not going to understand how good this story gets in the coming weeks. It's all pointing to Jesus. Ruth is pushing us forward to help us to see Jesus. It's all about him. And Jesus Christ He is God, and he loves you, and he's there to forgive us and to help us. He literally puts his wing over us, and he ultimately lets us be blessed because of his sacrifice in our place for our sins. And so in a moment, we're going to take communion. We're going to remember the broken body and the blood of Jesus, that Jesus literally pays for all of our debt and all of our sin. And as we partake in communion, let us, Christian, let us just remember the goodness of God in Ruth and the goodness of God in our lives. That it was the Lord who stopped the famine. It was the Lord who bound Ruth to Naomi in love. It was the Lord who preserved Boaz for Ruth. Ruth didn't just happen to wander into Boaz's field, but the Lord is kind. And he's good to all who take refuge under his wing. And so before we approach the table to take communion, let us just fall on our faces before the Lord and confess our unworthiness. And let us just seek refuge under his wing and just be astonished at his grace because he is that good. He's with us every step of the way. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the story of Ruth. God, if there's any of your kids in here that are stuck in chapter one, would you remind of the the truth of chapter two, that you're providentially good, that you're leading the way, and you're with us every step of the way. And Holy Spirit, you say that you are a guide and a helper and a counselor. Would you produce faith in us, perspective in us? Would you help us to see your goodness and trust you? Even when we can't see your hand moving, help us trust your heart loving. We love you. We thank you for Jesus.